I want to welcome you to our next Unamuno moment with a fabulous poet from the United States who's going to give a reading tonight. This is Unamuno poet number 14, I think. I'm losing count. Mary Jo Salter is with us tonight, and I'm thrilled to have you here. I want to give you a oh, hug. Oh, thank you, Spencer. And, um, oh, this is so much fun to be here. An honor. You know, before we did this, we were talking that I met you 30 years ago in Key West mm -hmm. uh, for a literary conference about Elizabeth Bishop. It was one of the first literary conferences about Elizabeth Bishop. And I remember you specifically talking about how she encouraged you to continue to write. And yeah. she wrote on one of your poems, I hope Miss Salter will continue to write. And I guess just for people that maybe aren't going to be able to come tonight to hear your reading, I thought it might be interesting for people to hear maybe more about that experience, the importance of encouragement, and what you're doing now. One, one, yeah. So go. Go. Well, um, <laughs> thank you. I think it was 1993 that we met, so that would be, we're younger than you think. It's oh, only, great. It was only 24 <laughs> years ago. Okay, good. And, um, and in 1974, which really was a really long time ago, um, I studied with Elizabeth Bishop at Harvard, and she um, gave the impression to people who would ask that she didn't really like teaching very much, but in fact, she was a wonderful teacher. And mm. um, because uh, it, uh, what you talk about, encouragement, um, when she liked something that you wrote, you knew that she wasn't lying. Yeah. <laughs> and and when she didn't, you knew that too. And I remember one of our assignments, I think I talked about this in the conference 24 the years ballerina. ago. There was that, yes. There, wow, you've got a good memory. And she told you to smudge it. She said, the poem you've written is perfect. And I thought, oh my goodness, Elizabeth Bishop just said I wrote something that was perfect. And she said, so I think you should rough it up a bit. Yeah, and I remember so that. So there was that, but in class, she had asked us all to um, write an imitation of a poet and we weren't supposed to say who we were imitating. So I brought in my poem, I read it. She couldn't guess who it was. No one could guess who it was. And I said, it's Keats. And there was a long pause and then she said, well, I suppose that sounds like Keats. Very young Keats. No, oh. he, he didn't ever get to be anything other than young, so I guess it was just like 12 year old Keats. But anyway, um, no, she, uh, it, it meant a lot to me that she um, uh, was, was there um, pushing us to read things that we would not have read, our, uh, read mm. on our own. For example, um, uh, Nadezhda Mandelstam's memoirs had just come out oh, yeah. and they were you know two 400 page books and she said i want you to read these because i want you to know that people have died for poetry Whoa. and you wouldn't have thought that elizabeth bishop who was not an explicitly political poet anyway mm -hmm. that that would be the first thing right that she no. would say mm -mm. you know um anyway um what am i doing now i'm uh yeah. i'm about to publish my eighth book of poems, which is called The Surveyors. Um, and the encouragement I got to write that title poem really comes from a young poet, um, uh, Matthew Yeager, who um, wrote me one day and said, I, I hardly knew him, and he said, I had a dream in which I was reading your poem called The Surveyors, but I can't find it anywhere. Can you send me a copy? And I wrote him back and I said, that poem does not exist. So then I had to write it. Yeah. So it comes from all, it comes from teachers, but it also comes from people that are younger than yourself. And, uh -huh. and that's part of what teaching is like too, is that people who are 25 can give you ideas. And do, you give like, encouragement. do you like teaching? I do. I mean, everything is an expenditure. Any expenditure of time could theoretically take you away from your writing. But it's it's a very most days it's a great opportunity to to mm. to be able to be there when people are young and just starting. And um, I've had some 
really magnificent students. Um, one who's just published a new, his first book, Richie Hoffman, uh, published a book called Second Empire. And I encourage everyone to read it. It's just phenomenal. Yeah. Now, um, so for people that don't know, when was your first book published? How was it published? And maybe just describe a little bit of the process of how you got started and what has kept you going? Have there been doubts or a little bit about that? Mm -hmm. I was unbelievably lucky. I think this is just a function of a com combination of I personally was lucky and also the times were different. It is much more difficult to get published today, I think. And so I had published some poems and magazines and was ready to send my book out. Mm. And uh, I sent it to Alice Quinn, who was running the poetry series at Knopf. Right. And she took it. And then she ended up becoming the poetry editor at The New Yorker. Right. And so when that happened, Anne Close, another editor there, took me, took me on, and um, she was my editor for another six books or something, and then now I'm, I'm with Deborah Garrison. So my editors have changed, but I've always had the same publisher, and that just almost never happens now. Yeah. I'm just yeah. very fortunate. Um, yeah. Yes, did I go through periods? I think the most scary thing was becoming a parent and thinking about what would that do to my writing? Would I have time to write? And that was Sylvia Plath's concern, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah, and we know how she ended. So, <laughs> you know, I mean, it is scary. It, and it is um, part of how that, what what I did was that, is I wrote some quite a few poems about my children. But after a certain point, I, I, I almost stopped doing that. I just wrote a poem for my older daughter's wedding. But in general, mm. I don't write about them anymore because it can be an intrusion. Yeah. But when they're children, a little less so. But uh, no, I was afraid. And I remember when I was very pregnant with my second child, I was trying to finish my second book. And I thought, so far, this is going okay. I can't keep on having a baby every time I try to publish a book. But I, I mean, then it became, first of all, will I ever write with, a, with becoming a parent? And then it was, you know, what's the synergy here? But anyway, um, yes. And every time you finish a book, you say to yourself, will I ever be able to I do know. this again? In fact, every time you finish a poem. I know. Right? I was reading somewhere where Louise Glick said she doesn't like calling herself a poet because she never knows if there is going to be a next poem. Yeah. That may be a bit of an exaggeration when yeah. you've written as much as she has, <laughs> but I, I take her point. Yeah. yeah. I have two more questions and then we'll, we'll finish because I think I could keep talking to you for a, a long time, but people will start to come in and, and we'll have the reading. One is, a, I, I just wanted to ask you what you thought of Sylvia Plath. Uh, when Mark Wunderlich was here, he gave a, a really inspiring reading and he said something like you can't not avoid dealing with her or, or responding to her in some way mm -hmm. which struck me because i'd never heard anybody articulate that that's one question and then mm -hmm. in closing I, I guess i'd like to finish with um mark strand and i just learned yesterday you're his literary executor and you know his spirit his soul that I got to know right before he passed away in New York just before I was moving to Madrid he was very encouraging of this series and I just feel like he's he's with me now yes and um, you know his former partners here tonight to hear you read and she's become a friend of mine and so those are my two questions Plath and then Strand and being a literary executor and what all that entails, and then we'll okay. we'll say goodbye and start the reading. <laughs> well, Sylvia Plath, um, you know, the older I get, the more impossible it seems that she could have accomplished what she had by the time she was thirty. It's crazy. And and you, what we all fear is that that kind of intensity is somehow related to the talent and the level of accomplishment. I mean. Intensity is necessary. I, I have I want to believe that writing didn't kill her. 
that right. it was a quite a separate thing that killed her. Yeah. And um, but she um, certainly is an essential poet of our time, and, and you know people will be reading her in a hundred years, absolutely. Um, and um, being a literary executor, I was actually, it started that as Amy Clampett's literary executor as well, with two wow. other people. Wow. And so I knew a little bit about it, um, but um, it's, it's too early to tell. But Mark, um, on, in one way, did know his own worth, and in other ways, he could be very, very modest. And he said, you know, well, nobody's ever going to want to yeah. read my biography. No one's ever going to want to read my letters. Nobody's going to want to write a book about me. And that's just not true. Not true. That will happen. Yeah. And so we'll see what it's like to be his executor. But it was a great honor that he asked me, and I'm just sorry he's not here. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for you. listening. What a pleasure. Thanks. Come to the reading.